Murder Report, a novel by James Acosta. Prologue. Carol was nervous as the security guard guided her through the prison psych ward. Her nerves were already shot. Carol's career as a 37-year-old journalist had taken her to many different places around the world. Now her boss, Randall, assigned her to interview one of the most notorious serial killers known to man. He indicated the focus should not be about how many people he killed, but more detail on how and why he killed his victims. Carol didn't want to do the interview at first. As Randall indicated, he felt that it would help boost their ratings for their documentary TV show. Carol reluctantly accepted the assignment. So here she was, almost face to face with the deranged serial killer for their very first interview. The name of the killer was Joe, or as some people called him, Psycho Sloppy Joe. He earned that nickname because how some of his murders went. The victims looked like a sloppy mess after he was done with them. The idea of her meeting someone who was as insane as he was made her sick to her stomach. Soon, the guard walked over to a chair and gestured for her to sit down. The chair faced directly right in the front of Joe's padded cell. She walked over to the chair and sat down. Carol saw what Joe looked like years ago when he was all over the news. However, the man she was now seeing was not that same man. No hair at all. And he was skinny as a twig. Joe also had no facial hair. He had dark brown eyes and he looked to be in his early 40s with pale skin, and he wore all white. Joe's face had a blank slate on it until a big grin on that face grew out. He was also the first to break the ice. Hi there. Carol, please don't be alarmed that I know your name. I see your show every week, so I bet I know why you're here. Carol bit her lower lip and thought about what she was going to say next. Well, I am here to do an interview. I understand that you have to give me permission first, so I'm here for a visit, and if things go well, I can come back again if you want, Carol answered. Yes, though I am here to interview you, I, I will need your consent in writing. Joe hopped off of his bed with the quickness of a hungry cheetah. He made his way up to the bars. Like a magic trick, Joe made a piece of paper appear out of thin air. Before she could grab it from his hand, the security guard came over to snatch it out of Joe's hand. The guard raised it to his face and examined the paper carefully. He looked at Carol. It's for safety purposes that I do this. Carol nodded her head. After seeing no threats with the paper, he handed it over to Carol. She noticed that Joe's signature was already on the paper. The expression of, I am the best, was written all over on the front and the back. She thought, just what is he the best at? Looking back at Joe, she noticed he was now sitting down on the floor cross-legged. His face was like that of a child's, who was eager for story time. Carol cut to the chase. Well, Joe, I see you are willing to tell us just exactly what happened. We know what you did. However, the news refused to disclose information on how you did it to an extent. We know you murdered in some very heinous ways. People researched online to find out just exactly what you did, but I want to hear it from your point of view. After all, your victims had no witnesses to your crimes. We also know that you requested an interview, and everyone but my boss had turned you down, so I guess you can count this as an exclusive interview. After we're done, we will air it on our show. If we have to come back, I'll bring a camera guy, and Joe interrupted. I want a Sloppy Joe sandwich from the best restaurant in town. And two big chocolate donuts. It's the only way I'll let you film me. Carol was taken aback by this, but she nodded her head in agreement. Okay, very well. I, I think I can do that. I'm a very busy journalist, and today my time is short, so if you could please get going with it. She readied her pen to her paper. Joe nodded, and he began to tell her the very dark tale of his descent into madness, and money, and murder. You have no idea what you are in for.
Chapter 1 You see, Carol, I can't jump into my carefully planned murders right off the bat. Oh no, I have to go back to when I was a child. Carol rolled her eyes and sighed. Okay, very well, then please start. Yes, of course. I was born in Pocatello, Idaho, in 1986. As I grew older as a child, I was unique. I didn't fit in with most kids. I was a loner and had a different look on life. So in elementary school and middle school, I kept to myself. In high school, I made just one friend. His name was Jake. Me and Jake were best friends. We watched scary movies, and we played all kinds of video games. However, the one thing we both loved the most were serial killers. We also loved watching true crime dramas and murder documentaries. I learned that my favorite was Jack the Ripper. He was the best of them all. During his time, he murdered left and right. Not that you didn't know that already. He was the best because he never, ever got caught. Just like the Zodiac Killer as well. He inspired me to be better than him. I knew that it was just a fantasy that I would never actually be able to get away with murder. One day, Jake and I had a conversation about murder fantasies, how we could do it and what measures to make sure we'd never get caught. Most importantly of all, who would it be who would get killed? Well, we were speaking hypothetically at first. We both decided that it would have to be the shithead Kyle. He was the high school's big-time bully, you see. He'd give the kids swirlies and steal their lunch money. We both laughed at the idea that if he was gone, the whole school would be better off. After that conversation, we slowly started to realize that we actually wanted to do it. We decided on a time, a place, and how and how how we'd hide the body. It ended up being a Saturday night. We knew that his parents would be out of town for the weekend. We were going to wear gloves, break into his home, and we'd walk to his bedroom while he was sleeping. We would smother him in his sleep with a store-bought pillow. We'd lift his body onto a huge blue top, wrap it up nice and neat, and head out to a forest to where we would build a big fire. We'd burn the body to where there was no trace of it left. After that, we'd head home and dispose of the gloves and pillow in a sewer drain. So we both set out to do our murder. We were about halfway to his house when it started to rain and thunder. We didn't get any further because lightning struck and killed my best friend right in front of me. Once that happened, the plan was over. I went to a secure location to call an ambulance. The paramedics came and picked him up. After that, my interest in killing the bully or anyone else was gone. At least for a while anyways. You see, I felt like God punished my friend before he could do it, right before my very own eyes. It was some messed up form of karma, more like pre-karma, because we didn't even do the deed. So my interest to kill was all gone. I focused on my future and what I wanted to do with it. Carol raised her hand. Joe took a big yawn and let her speak. Hold on one second. You said that the paramedics arrived and took your friend away? What did you do with all the stuff that you guys were carrying? I mean, didn't you think that they would have wondered why you guys had all those items with you? Joe nodded. Ah, good question. You see, I knew that those would stand out to them as suspicious. 
So before they could arrive, I made sure to stash it away in a bush. I mean, they questioned me for sure. I just told them that we were out on a late night walk and tragedy struck, literally. They didn't question any more of it. There was a funeral for Jake the very next week, and once he was gone, I had no other choice but to get on with my life. From that point forward, I decided that I wasn't going to try and have any close friends like that anymore. That's when Carol knew she had to say something because she was realizing it was hard to get a word in edgewise. So, you need to know that this is an interview and I need to ask you a few questions as well. Joe nodded his head again. What about your parents during all of this? I mean, were they a part of your life? Did they treat you well at all? Yes, they both loved me very much. My dad was an over-the-road trucker making money for the family. My mom was a stay-at-home housewife. She took good care of me. My fondest memory of my mother was her teaching me how to play chess. I played it so well in high school that I would win all of the chess tournaments. They say playing chess makes you smarter. As a matter of fact, chess actually became a big part of my murders. It taught me how to plan everything out very carefully. If I was to be better than Jack the Ripper and never get caught, I had to think very carefully about my moves before I made them. Just like chess. Well, anyways, as soon as I graduated from high school, college was next on my agenda. I planned to go into business in legal. I did all that just fine. I actually got a scholarship for winning a Grandmaster's Chess Tournament. I excelled in all my classes, and after six years of college, I was set. However, my life didn't go as expected then. The first thing was I studied hard to learn the ins and outs of the stock market. I studied it every chance I could when I was working for a loan company. I was quick to learn, and not before long, I was making money hand over fist. Learning this and being occupied with school in the past kept my thoughts of wanting to murder far out of my mind. The other thing that I developed a habit of doing was playing the lottery. I lost a lot. However, one day on a Friday the 13th of all days, I won the mega lottery and I won $25 million. Granted, this was a few years after playing the stocks, I ended up having a $65 million net worth. I was only 30 and I was ready to retire. I played the game right, and now I was all on my own. With my newfound budget, I set out to buy some personal property. It was a small island that suited my needs. I made sure I had everything I could dream of and decided to have a big mansion built on a plot of land that I scouted out for myself. I made sure that the mansion would have an Olympic-sized swimming pool, and I also purchased a huge yacht. I was chilling out by a custom-built dock that I had a personal contractor build for me. The mansion that was being built consisted of 40 stories. I also made sure to have a runway for an airplane that had an autopilot feature. I also had one guest house built about maybe 50 feet away from the mansion. I also thought it would be fun to have a very tall oversized tree house built as well. It was tall enough to bungee jump off of. I also had a pig farm placed in the backyard of my mansion and a garden nearby. It was about an acre long. I'm telling you all this for a reason you'll see later on. Joe was about to continue on with his past when he noticed the time on the clock hanging from the wall inside of his cell. It was almost 8 p.m. His face twisted in a panic and nervously twiddled his thumbs. Carol noticed all this and was about to ask what was wrong. Well, lady, it's getting late and I need to get back to bed before... 
Carol felt confused with a blank stare. I need to have you leave now, before they show up. If they show up while I'm awake, they won't let me sleep for the rest of the night. Who shows up? Carol asked. Look, lady, come back tomorrow and I'll explain what I'm talking about. Also, don't forget the donuts and the sloppy Joe sandwich. Don't forget to bring that camera guy as well. I will go into much more detail later. Carol stood up from her chair. Well, okay, that'll work. I'll be here at noon tomorrow. I will make sure that will happen. Carol waved goodbye and signaled for the guard to provide her escape back to the entrance. As they were heading back over to the front entrance, the guard said, Any minute now you should hear him screaming out loud to himself with, Leave me alone! They say he's a schizo, that he hears voices inside his head. Some say it's the spirits of the victims that haunt him, that they tease and taunt him. I don't buy that bull, though. The guy is a basket case. As they both approached the front entrance, Carol said, Yeah, I agree with you totally. He will never be able to be normal again. It's almost sickening and intriguing to talk to him at the same time. Yes, totally. If you plan on being back here tomorrow, make sure to sign your name on the check-in sheet at the desk. We need to know in advance for future guest visits. Carol nodded and did as she was told. The guard waved her goodbye as she left the front doors. Once Carol made it out to her car, she pulled out her cell phone and dialed her boss Randall's number. She heard his voice on the other end of the phone. Hi, Carol. So tell me what went down. It went well. He wants to have a camera guy over tomorrow, and he wants a sloppy Joe sandwich from the best restaurant in town. That's what he needs to continue the interview with me. There was a pause. Yes, sure, that won't be a problem at all. I mean, sure, it's a little strange, but I'll see to it. I'll text you an address to the best restaurant around here. It really is a five-star for sure. I'll have Max tag along with you tomorrow as he's going to be your camera guy. He's had the opportunity to film many things throughout his career. For now, I want you to get home and rest up. You're going to need your energy for tomorrow. Don't forget that we do have a deadline, so we will need to hurry on this one, okay? Carol quickly replied. Yes, sure. You can count on me. I'll get it done and on time. That's what I want to hear. Take care for now. Her boss ended the call. Carol started her car as she was ready to finally head home. When Carol finally arrived, she made her way out of the car and headed up to the open front door. Once inside, Carol made her way over to the kitchen table and sat in a chair. She pulled her notebook and pen out of her purse and wrote some notes down about her first visit with Psycho Sloppy Joe. As Carol wrote, she would occasionally look up at the clock on her wall. It was about 9.30 p.m. when Carol penned a very descriptive encounter about her meeting with Joe how he certainly seemed to be off his rocker, and that he was very calm until around 8. Around that time, he just started to act really weird. She wondered what that was all about. Carol took a moment and tried to shake the memory off. When that time finally came around, Carol closed her notebook and put the pen back in the pen holder. She headed off to the bedroom, pulled the covers off the bed, and lied down. She got all nice and comfy and fell fast into a deep sleep. Carol was on a boat and sitting right next to someone who appeared to be wearing a scuba diver mask and, just, and he was decked out in scuba gear. This person looked like a man that she couldn't identify because the mask covered his face. She looked down and saw she wore a pair of flippers on her feet and a scuba diving outfit. The man in the scuba gear signaled to her that he was ready to dive off the boat and motioned for her to do the same. He dived backwards first. Then, it was her turn. The moment Carol dived, she blacked out under the water. She couldn't breathe under the water, despite the fact that she had scuba gear on. She was sinking into the water and drowning. She woke up in a cold sweat, gasping for air. Carol glanced at the clock. It read 3 a.m. She felt shaken by the nightmare. She usually had good dreams. This one was different, and it almost felt real. Carol decided to ultimately shake the entire thing off and try to go back to sleep. Carol woke up around 9 a.m. She made her way out of her bed and got ready for the day. Everything was going fine until she walked up to her kitchen table. 
her notebook was opened, and a few words were written on a piece of paper. He murdered us. Carol was confused and creeped out at the same time. Who could have written this, she wondered. There's no one else here but me. She decided to pick up her cell phone and give her friend a call. She had to find out who did this. Carol's appointment with Joe was going to be a little late. Okay, Slashaholics, this has been the prologue and chapter one of Murder Report by James Acosta. James reached out to me and requested that I narrate his uh, book and asked me to um, voice Sloppy Joe, Psycho Sloppy Joe, kind of like I do Dr. Loomis. And, uh, you know, I enjoy doing these voices, and as I'm reading this, I'm glad that he went with that voice, because I, I feel like it matches up with this character, and I'm really getting in Sloppy Joe's head. But yeah, I really enjoyed the prologue, the introduction, you know, the interview being set up, his backstory, very creepy vibes, something a little more going on uh, than what we're seeing. And now with Carol having a note written while she's sleeping and that weird dream she had, I'm excited to get back to this one very soon. Until then, this has been your friendly neighborhood 80 slasher librarian saying thanks for listening, be excellent to each other, and always remember, the sun never sets on those who ride into it. I'll see you soon.